and welcome back to Coffee Break Chats with Authors. I'm Pete Alden. Our topic today is book openings or opening paragraphs. And our guest is an amazing writer, amazing editor, Rhonda Parrish. Rhonda, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And I should say, Rhonda and I have known each other for probably 10 or 11 years. And this is the first time we're actually meeting or at least talking face to face, which is pretty cool. So Rhonda, you you bought my second ever, so my second short story sale ever was to you. For oh, no, really? yes. Yeah, which is pretty cool. And we've written a story together as well, which we should put in the show notes. Oh, we should. It's a good one. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Very, started very oddly and <laughs> became a very satisfying story. Had a pretty good opening paragraph too from memory. That's true. We should have gone with that. <laughs> we should have been. <laughs> bit of uh, flagrant self-promotion. So today what we thought we'd do is to each pick three or four books. Um, we've gone for four, but we're not sure if we have any overlap. So it'll be kind of, we, we don't know each other's list. And just read the, the opening paragraph of these books and talk quickly to why it works for us, you know, why it's so special, why it's kind of got that spark. Rhonda, would you like to take us away with the first book? Um. This is the one that I think if we're going to have overlap, it's it's going to be this because anytime you talk about opening paragraphs, you have to talk about The Haunting of Hill House. Okay. No, we have not overlapped on that. Oh, wow. Okay. I've never read it. I've never read it so. I went looking for my, my <clears throat> actual copy of the book and I couldn't find it. There's too many bookshelves in this house. <laughs> <laughs> but I printed it up. So the opening paragraph. Of, Hill, of The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within, Walls continued upright, bricks met neat neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. Ooh. Right? Man. There's so much in that. Tell us, why, why does that occupy such a special place in your heart? It just, it's... It's kind of perfect. Like it just grabs your attention. It sets the voice. It sets the tone. It it tells you where the story is taking place. There's people who are are, are much, much smarter than me who have gone through and like broken it down and analyzed every sentence and every piece of punctuation. And the pauses are amazing. And it's just it's like it's like poetry but it's not obscure you don't like you don't you don't need to work really hard to understand it but if you want to dive deeper into it there's also layers there that you could peel back there's a couple of things just first time hearing that there's a couple of things that strike me one was the setup of the house as a living thing that was very clever yeah and can you read that last sentence again because that really just a great hook Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House and whatever walked there, walked alone. Yeah. It's right? There's, there's just menace in that. Yours. And I don't know why there's menace in it. <laughs> it's, yeah. Because it's... That it's a house and it is not sane and there's something in it and yeah it's oh, it really does give me shivers every time I read it like it doesn't actually ever get old that's amazing yeah and it's <laughs> I've, I've watched the Netflix series now I actually want to read the book I haven't the book haven't. is it's significantly different than the the series okay. um but but good yeah. <laughs> Well, if it continues in that vein, it sure is. It would be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go with the next one. So this this is uh, Elizabeth Moon's Speed of, of Dark, which uh, 
I was originally cap captivated by the title. And then as soon as I read the blurb and realised it was about, well, the main character is a young man with autism. Oh, I have to read this. Uh, and, and then finding out that she's, she's the mother of a young man with, with autism. And this is kind of a, a tribute, I guess, to him. Um, yeah, really hooked me in. But I just think this is a... So I have worked for 12, 13 years with people uh, who, have, who are on the autism spectrum. Um, I have friends you know, who consider themselves to have Asperger's syndrome. I'm probably on the, on the spectrum myself quite, quite seriously. I just find this nails the kind of thought patterns and the things that someone would, would be obsessed with um, who has autism. So questions, always questions. They didn't wait for the answers either. They rushed on piling questions on questions, covering every moment with questions, blocking off every sensation but the thorn stab of questions. I just, yeah, <laughs> it just, it's that frustration with something, like you are immersed in that person's experience, I think, from the beginning. And you're often told not to have an echo on words, but her use of that one word. <laughs> and, and when she gets to the thorn stab, it's like, yeah, that, that's exactly the way that she's using that word is like stab, 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 uh, all the way through it. So, yeah. Thorn stab is a that's a wonderful description and i like how the the content uh is mirrored in in the the like you say the the form like the questions 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 like they're they're complaining about the constant questions and they're they're using the word over and over and in the same way they're saying they never wait for the answers they never give us any answers we don't know what the questions are but there's just like question mm -hmm. after question yeah. it's, it's really immersive and it, it definitely has a voice to it it definitely does and, it, and it's one of those things like i just want to keep reading because it continues in that in that vein um but but again you know working with people with autism often i hear that kind of thing merit in, in the thing of like what's the point of this why are we doing this and it's like yeah well i can understand you need relevance and that's that you know, straight away, like, this is just bugging me, but there's no point to it, which makes it even more painful for the person too. So, yeah, yeah, that's one of my favourites. All right, next. Uh, next. I'm, I'm conflicted. Okay, I'm going to go with the second book that I couldn't find my copy of. Ah, <laughs> so it is somewhere. It is somewhere. Um, it's The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. Ooh. So the first paragraph is actually only one sentence. Okay. So I'll read that and then I'll pause for a moment and then I'll read just a little bit more to give a little bit more context. So chapter one, how nobody came to the graveyard. There was a hand in the darkness and it held a knife. The knife had a handle a polished black bone and a blade finer and sharper than any razor. If it sliced you, you might not even know that you'd been cut. Not immediately. The knife had done almost everything it was brought to that house to do, and both the blade and the handle were wet. Wow. Jeez. Right? <laughs> Phenomenal. That, that first sentence, you're immediately, a cinematic, isn't it? You have a, a media picture of something yeah real yeah and it's so i mean it is incredibly evocative and also you immediately want to know more yes yeah <laughs> it's just the hook is in and he's just re <laughs> just reeling you really yeah but every, with every sentence that hook kind of gets in deeper too yeah so sorry about it, the, yeah sorry about the imagery there but that's <laughs> <laughs> And when you consider the the context that this is like it it's not it's a book that's not specifically targeted at adults right it's uh i nice. like that it it is is willing to go into dark places hmm. i mean he doesn't he <clears throat> describes it exactly the right amount right you know that this is the knife is is held there's a hand in the darkness and it held a knife and you know whoever the hand is attached to is probably not a good person <laughs> you know the the knife is is not there to do good things <laughs> but you don't need all of the the like the gory details right yeah there's there's enough menace and, and questions in there as you said to keep you 
keep you interested. And a knife is not a defensive weapon. Right. Say. So you, you immediately think, hmm, what's this person hiding in the dark holding a knife for? That's probably not good for someone else. And as soon as, as, soon as you read that the blade and the handle were wet, you know bad stuff has already happened. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, well, it's either blood or sweat. It's, it's, one, of, it's one of the two, and it's probably blood. <laughs> it's dark, so you never know for sure. You never know for sure, but I get the feeling that you find out. You find out pretty quickly. Pretty quickly, yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Now, I'm going to apologize for the for the edition that I've got here. I, I had, <laughs> had lost my original, um, well, not original, but it was the 1980s version, which was the one that I first read myself when I was a young fella. But yeah, I Am Legend is just one of the one of the most re-readable books I think I've ever come across in my life. And you know, he's kept it nice and short and it's perfect. So that economy of language, um, I think he starts that way as well. But there's no fluff. So the very first paragraph, again, is just a sentence, but it's a bit longer one. On those cloudy days, Robert Neville was never sure when sunset came. And sometimes they were in the streets before he could get back. I, it works for me because, again, it's immersive. Like the, the paragraphs that we've read so far are pretty immersive. That one takes you into, I mean, you don't even have to know what the story is about to already get that sense of uh, here's a guy with a, in a situation with a problem. He's in a setting with a problem. There's something to do with, with dark coming uh, you know, he might lose track of time and it's, there's something about if he doesn't get home in time before they come out, whoever they are, then he's probably in some kind of, some kind of danger. And I just think it sets the tone for the story very, very well. And it, it's his entire world in the beginning is about that. It's about getting stuff done during the day and getting home before dark to board up the house again so that the vampires can't get him, get at him. Um, and it kind of drifts off from that for the next few paragraphs. But I still think that that's enough for me to kind of go, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to see what this is about and where this goes. So, yeah. It definitely has that, that sense of menace, right? You can, you can feel it there even if though you don't quite know what it is. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that he just calls them they, <laughs> which is great. You don't, in his head, that's what they are. They're just they. Them. And it's it's far more powerful than if he'd said the vampires. If he says the vampires, you're like, okay, another vampire book, whatever. Yeah. But if yeah. he says and they, you're like, well, what are they? Yeah, what are they? That's exactly, yeah. So, so it's a nice have to keep review. reading. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, what's your third book? I got some physical copies of books now. Ooh. So we're going to we're gonna go with uh, Christmas Carol oh. by Charles Dickens. Very cultured choice. Which I read like every Christmas because you have to nice. and I think that the Muppets version might actually be my favorite <laughs> film version but <laughs> is it true to the book though is it true to the book I mean as much as a Muppets movie you can be <laughs> um stave one Marley's ghost Marley was dead to begin with there is no doubt whatever about that the register of his, of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Oof. Wow. Again, I've never read any of the books you're, you're mentioning, so this is the first time hearing that. And that's, wow. Even that first, what, just read that first line again. Marley was dead to begin with. That's a great line. <laughs> That's a great line. I told my husband that we were going to be talking about about book openings and asked what his favorite openings were. And uh, uh, he he talked about a couple of books which are, are are not my favorite, but were his favorite. And then he just said Marley was dead. And I was like, oh, my gosh, right? I have to go with Marley was dead to begin with. <laughs> Dickens is, that book's on my shelf, but every time I look at it, I go, mm. <laughs> he's a, I find him a tough writer to read, but every, his, his gift with language was just extraordinary. Um, yeah. This one's short, which helps. And it's, it's actually quite voicey. Like it, mm. it goes on from that, like in a narrative voice, 
straight up like give give it a try is what i'm saying it's it's not like great expectations heavy it's it's a little okay bit. okay <laughs> <laughs> i will give it a try i literally just packed it into a box two days ago because we're in the middle of moving as i told you i'll dig it out i'll dig it out and and, and read it Pay all right this this yeah yeah, Christmas here, yeah, which is probably when by the time I'll get to opening those boxes, let's let's be honest. This is the one because we both know the author. I wondered whether it, it might show up on your list, but this is a, a clockwork dagger by Beth Cato. And yeah, I'll, I'll read the opening paragraph, and I, I think you can kind of guess why I like this so much. <clears throat> Again, it's pretty much one long sentence, but Octavia Leander's journey to her new source of employment was to be guided by three essential rules. And already I want to read this in a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> that she hide her occupation lest others take advantage. That she be frugal with her coin and avoid any indulgences that come with newfound independence. And that she shun the presence of men as nothing useful or proper could possibly happen in their company. <laughs> it's just... It's just a, a ripping good opening paragraph. Um, it The voice, you know, you're talking about being voicey just then, but Beth just nails that voice all the way through this novel. It's got that wry, dry sense of humour about it. Uh, it. The language is beautiful. She uses it. It's, it's not purple prose. It doesn't get too kind of flowery, but there's enough of it in there to give it a bit of gravitas. But just that little, you know, nothing useful could come from the company of men. To yes. this. It's a worldview. That's the character's worldview. It's not just an opinion. Um, it's yeah, a, it tells you a lot about that character and the world. Yes. Yes, I hadn't thought of that, actually. Yes, it's very true. Very true. But uh, Beth, if you're watching... Good job. You're up there with Dickens. So and Matthew. Right? <laughs> Good company. Yeah, and deservedly so. Right. Do you, did you have one more? I do. So yeah. I actually, I went down to, uh, to find my copy of Emma and I couldn't find it. So, but I found this sitting on the shelf near where it was. Emily of New Moon by Ellen Montgomery, which- I've never heard of this book. Oh, really? I, oh, it was one of my favorites when I was quite young. And when I was, I was looking for Emma and I was like, I feel like I remember that this had a really good opening paragraph too. So I pulled it off the shelf and I was like, oh, it does. <laughs> so, The House in the Hollow. The House in the Hollow was a mile from anywhere. So Maywood people said, it was situated in a grassy little dale looking as if it had never been built like other houses but had grown up there like a big brown mushroom. It was reached by a long green lane and almost hidden from view by an encircling growth of young birches. No other house could be seen from it, although the village was just over the hill. Ellen Green said it was the lonesomest place in the world and vowed that she wouldn't stay there a day if it wasn't that she pitied the child. If it wasn't that she could eat the child. No, pity that yeah. she pitied the child. Pitied the child. Well. I think I had a I think I had a glitch with my Wi-Fi and I was like, <laughs> eat the child. Now I'm interested. <laughs> That's a whole different story, I think. Yeah. So what is it about that that really grabs you so much? I love the it's gonna seem like I have a fixation on houses, but I love how the the house is a setting and it's it's like it's described as having grown up like a big mushroom it wasn't yeah. built it's just it just fits in with the environment so perfectly it's like it just sprouted there and i love the last sentence i love that it was the loneliest place in the world and she wouldn't be there if she didn't pity the child because then i'm immediately like well who's the child and what's the yeah. why the pity and yeah what makes it's, it so lonely it's setting up there's a lot to love there. So the, the house growing was the thing that really caught my attention. And it's, it seems to sit right in the middle of that paragraph too. So it's kind of a crucial thing. But yeah, I, I, I'm the same. I'm thinking, wow, there's a, there's a relationship here. There's stakes here. Is, is she losing something by pitying this child and staying in this place? Yeah, it's very clever. 
very clever. What's the rest of the book about? Like, what's what's this? What's that setting up for? Uh, well, it's like uh, <laughs> an or for, let me. Uh, I was just going to read the back, but it doesn't actually have the description on there. Um, let me read the back anyway. It just says, in the celebrated Emily trilogy, in which Emily of New Moon is the first volume, Montgomery draws a more realistic portrait of a young girl's life on Prince Edward Island. The twin threads of bright and dark, love and cruelty, hope and despair intertwine in a pattern as significant as it is enduring. It insightfully portrays the beauty and anguish of growing up. So I last read it when I was about 13. So my memories are, are vague, but there's the, the part that I really, it's about an orphan who goes to live with, with family and stuff. But the part that I really related to was Emily felt like she lived in her own space. She was very lonely, like the house, but she used her mind and her imagination to, to build a world for herself and stuff. I mean, that's the part that I connected to as a kid. There's, that's not the actual plot plot <laughs> but, yeah, it's but a key, that's the part a that key feature of it that that touches you yeah, yeah that's the part that i remember like i i have vague remember members of the i have vague memories not remembers wording is hard <laughs> i have i have vague memories of the plot but the part that i remember is is that part mm. it's <laughs> it's how it made me feel actually which is actually kind of part of the what we're talking about with all these openings, right? It's how they make us feel and how they make us want to read more and yes, connect yeah. them. It's very true. It's very true. And it's, it's interesting. I think I'm looking for either um, thrill, you know, something's going to make me go, oh, like there's danger or something here, there's excitement ahead, or fun. Like that is, that's fun. I'm not that there's no thrills in the book, but they're just like that final line about, men just make me <laughs> fun. And I think, yeah, I want to, this is fun. I want to keep reading this. Um, that's, yeah, yours is a little bit more poignant though <laughs> than, than that, I think. My my last one, I've kind of, we've gone from Dickens to zombie apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> so I, because um, I kind of went, oh, the, the three I've got, I feel like they're, they're fairly serious literature in one way, in one way. And often this is kind of trashed as, it's not, re you know, it's just airplane kind of fodder. Right. You know, just read on the airplane, throw it away in the bin at the other end of your trip kind of thing. But I, I think uh, Zito did a really good job with this book. It's, it's my favourite zombie book. And, in fact, I can't, like, because I've written Zombie Apocalypse, I'm kind of over it. I can't read it anymore. But this is it. I can read this. I, I really like this book. So the, this is the opening, the opening paragraph from this. And if you don't know anything else about it, it it's quite interesting. It's quite a long one, sorry. So the corpse crouched in the shallow mud water along the lake, shirtless and saggy chested, grabbing at minnows that darted between the green rocks. Marco studied it through his binoculars. Sometimes the dead surprised him, so quick with their hands, but so uncoordinated, like toddlers. He watched the corpse strike and come up empty. Then again, gawking at its palm while its reptilian brain groped to understand the failure Failing at that too, it splashed after the next silver flash of fish. So there's a there's a lot to love for me in that. There's some really nice turns of phrase like you know scrawny and saggy chested, the silver flash of fish. It's a really great picture too. But um, you are you kind of in that there's the question thing again of why is this guy watching a zombie through binoculars or why is he so interested in this zombie trying trying to catch fish there's a little bit of humor in it too like the silliness of it mm -hmm. but, but then there's also this kind of empathy that he has for the for the dead person that um that actually remains through the rest of the book it actually sets up his character very cleverly um for reasons uh he has empathy for the dead and that's an unusual thing in a zombie apocalypse mm -hmm. story that someone would, you know, sometimes people in characters in those stories go, oh, you know, when she was alive, when he was alive, or they were a nice person, it's a shame what's happened to them. But he's actually seeing that that corpse as a as a person, as a still living person in a, in a kind of ironic way. 
Um, yeah, and I just think like that's because he that that's the kind of polish he approaches the rest of the book with, which is a thriller. It's a, it's a thriller, but it's it's very well well written and well thought out. I like the the sense of humor in in that. You know, failing at that too. He just, like that that was really good, and I also like that there's a zombie trying to catch fish. That's that's not normal. So I'm intrigued by like why is the zombie trying to catch fish? Usually they just only worry about humans, right? Sure. In in most zombie apocalypse things, they aren't they aren't out there hunting and gathering much. Yes. <laughs> Which is fantastic. Fantastic. It's a, it adds a little bit of credibility to it as well, I think. The thing's hungry, it sees movement, it's triggered by the movement and it recognizes mm. that as food. Um, and that humanizes it as well. It. Yeah, but it just <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. And the awkwardness like a toddler. You know, like a little kid is just a beautiful bit of again empathy, but also description. You can you can picture that that awkwardness really well. So yes. I think we've we've had eight great authors that have done a pretty darn good job of, of picking <laughs> off their novels. Not that Dickens needs our approval, but uh, well done, Charles. <laughs> we'll give it to him anyway. <laughs> That's it. Um, we'll we'll wrap this up uh, because we do try and keep these kind of within someone's coffee break. But but Rhonda, uh, as as a writer yourself as an editor do you have a book recommendation for other writers who are watching this or do you have like a writing exercise or a writing prompt um i really like on writing by stephen king um i don't it, it's part like how to write and part just autobiography and i don't agree with everything that he says in there um but it is a, a good sort of place to start reading. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin also has a book called Steering the Craft, which I've uh, been working through the exercises on, just picking up every now and there's a lot of prompts right in there. So um, it's it's when I get stuck, I occasionally pick it up and go look at some of the prompts and uh, and, and maybe do one of those, but I've had it for like three years and I still haven't made it through all of the prompts yet. But what I have have been fantastic. So those would be my two main recommendations. That's brilliant. So I'm really annoyed at you because today you've given me five new books to put on my to be <laughs> list <laughs> to, to buy and put on here. I hadn't heard of the Legin one either. So that that sounds fantastic. That sounds it really, is really, really good. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, folks, we want to let you get back to work because you're probably watching this in a coffee break. Uh, Rhonda is going to join us in a new episode. So we'll see you very soon.